Aloha, welcome to Cooper Union. What's happening with human rights around the world on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, and Moana Nui Akea. I'm your host, Joshua Cooper. The title of today's episode is the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues 21st Session, Indigenous People's Rights in the Mekong Delta. The UN PFII is actually bringing together Indigenous peoples from around the planet to discuss the most important initiatives in human rights. Today, the Khmer Kampuchea Crown representatives from the Mekong Delta share their unique history and current challenges facing indigenous peoples in Southeast Asia. Moni, thank you so much for joining us. Can you share and tell us where the Khmer Krom people originate from and how are the Khmer Krom Kampuchea Federation organizing to make sure the world is aware of the human rights of your people? Thank you, Joshua Kubert. Uh, for you know, giving us an opportunity to talk at the, your program today. So um, we are the background people from the Mekong Delta. And originally, um, the, the our homeland will belong to uh, Cambodia. But seeing the French uh, colonization uh, hand over transfer our homeland to Vietnam during uh, uh, June 4, 1949. And our background people now living under, under Vietnam, so the people uh, I just know that you know the South Vietnam uh, only have the Khmer people, those not uh, uh, only belong to Vietnam, not uh, Cambodia. So for us as the indigenous people of the Mekong Delta, uh, we have no voice. The people back home has no voice. Unfortunately, that we have the Khmer Khan people living around the world, and we formed the Khmer Khan Khmer Federation um, just to advocate for our people voice in the Mekong Delta, and. Um, People may know about the Taban, right? Uh, people from the bad, or um, but not a lot of people know that the, the Mekong, the, uh, originally uh, in the Mekong Delta. So we, as an initiative, people, we try to you know let the world know uh, the, the issue, the, the problem that our Mekong people are facing. But unfortunately, the people back home they cannot go outside of Vietnam to uh, tell the world uh, the, the issue. So our organization. Uh, fortunate that uh, attend the uh, uh, United Nations Permanent Forum on issues issues in 2004. So since then, uh, the world know more about the Khmer Krom issue. And uh, thank you, Joshua, too, like helping our organization, you know, to bring this issue to the to the UN. And uh, we've been at, um, actively attend the UN since 2004. And the Vietnamese government always uh, deny. Uh, those not recognize our people as indigenous people, and even though claim that our organization has no right to represent for our people, but without that, our organization, the Khmer issue will not known by the world. So hopefully through this program, uh, you know, the world will know more about the Khmer and uh, the issue that we are uh, bringing to the UN for this year. Tony, thank you so much for the introduction to share about the rich history of the Khmer Krom people in Kampuchea. And I see Priscilla, you're in the UN General Assembly Hall. We know yesterday that's where the opening took place. And of course, what's really important about the Permanent Forum in this two week session that happens every spring is they usually pick a theme. This year's theme is indigenous people's business autonomy and the human rights principles of due diligence, including free prior informed consent. Why is that theme so significant for the Khmer Krom people in the Mekong Delta? And why did you come to New York this week? Thank you, Joshua. Yes, so this theme is very important to the Khmer Krom people of the Mekong Delta for many reasons, uh, because our Khmer Krom people lack the legal recognition as indigenous peoples in Vietnam. And so this lack of awareness really <laughs> creates systemic oppression and discrimination against our communities in order to improve their businesses and livelihoods of our people. So because uh, we are not recognized as indigenous peoples, Vietnam also does not um, support the rights of indigenous peoples that would um, also allow us to move forward in protecting us um, in terms of business and human rights and those guiding principles. And so one of the biggest issues is how um, Vietnam is one of the biggest rice exporters in, in the world, yet our rice farmers continue to be left behind because uh, one, the government of Vietnam has discriminatory price controls on our rice exports, which really keeps our people in poverty. 
Another thing is that um, the Khmer people also face human rights abuses by the businesses in the area. So for example, um, in one of our provinces in the Mekong Delta, uh, land, crude oil is being extracted from the shores of where our people live. However, there's no free prior or informed consent with our people. So unfortunately, you know, our people are not only having their land being taken from them and not having equal access in terms of fair market um, competition with their, with their rice production, but they're also not getting any benefit or uh, dialogue with the businesses and state when it comes to extracting resources from their land. Thank you so much, Priscilla. So T, you know, you've also been here at the UN Permanent Forum often. Why is this theme so important? And what was it like to speak and address them? this annual assembly and being able to share the words of the people back home who aren't able to speak for themselves due to the political pressure. Yeah, so I think it's definitely an honor and a privilege to be a voice for our people because without the KKF here, our people wouldn't be able to engage in the mechanisms of the UN. And so I know that there is a big following on Facebook and they're just so proud and happy that, that we're doing something for them. So I, it's definitely, um, you know, it, I'm, I'm so honored to, to be a voice and we're excited to continue this mission um, to advocate for their rights. And so um, I think, uh, you know, the work that we do is very important. And um, in particular, I just also wanted to add kind of what Priscilla was saying, like this, this theme is super important because it covers so many different types of topics, you know, and it's interlinked in, in, in a big way um, because, uh, you know, the recognition of us as indigenous people is very important uh, because um, it allows us to access the rights that is enshrined in the UN DDRIP. And it's really time, you know, our people, I can share an example, for example, one of our youth, uh, you know, they basically, um, printed and they printed a translated copy of UND drip and um and basically they got tortured uh, they got arrested um and so this indigenous indigenous led um initiative was met with a lot of violence from the government and that's something that we're very concerned about uh, because it's it it is our right, um, according to Article Three and Four of UN DDRIP, to be recognized, to self-identify as Indigenous, and we want to make sure that the voices of our people are heard in the process. And uh, we are here today uh, to make sure that that is happening. Thank you, so T. And it is exciting. We have So Quintia with us, who is a sophomore in high school, and while most youth are doing Model United Nations, you're actually here to talk about this an important issue of free prior and informed consent. What's it like to be at the UN and what are some other points you think that the world should know about what's happening in the Mekong Delta? Uh, uh, thank you again, um, Uncle Josh, for allowing us to be on the show. This is such a great opportunity for us. Um, honestly, this has been such a phenomenal experience coming over here to New York and actually experiencing what firsthand what is going on in the United Nations. Um, yeah, the Mekong, uh, what our people have gone through in the Mekong Delta is um, really disheartening and it's not really like exposed a lot. So it's such a great opportunity to be able to represent my people and ex like talk at such a uh, important and like big conference room and be able to tell everyone that Oh, this is these are our issues, and you know this is why we need to speak up because like if we don't do it, no one will. So being so young too is kind of intimidating because everyone here is so much older. But um, the, everyone's uh, um, coming here with open hands, and everyone's so inclusive. Uh, so I really do um, appreciate this opportunity, and I really do um, thank you for this, um, up this position. Well, it's an honor to have you here and for the you to be able to share with the world what's going on. And it's also just the opening, but what's really important probably is also the theme that's the UN Decade of Indigenous Languages. Priscilla, can you share why that's so important? I think you'll actually be going 
to your homeland and trying to learn your indigenous language. Why is this theme of the UN Decade of Indigenous Languages, which begins in 2022, so important to you? And what do you think is important that the UN can do going forward to protect the indigenous peoples in the Mekong Delta to be able to make sure that your mother tongue will actually flourish and not be made extinct by horrible policies and detrimental actions against the indigenous people just for practicing their own right to language. Yes, this, this theme on indigenous languages is incredibly important to our Khmer people and to me, especially because I grew up in the United States, it was difficult for me to maintain our native language uh, because I always spoke English in the United States. So for me, I'm excited and privileged to have the opportunity to go back and learn my language. But unfortunately, for the Khmer people living in the Mekong Delta of Vietnam, they have endured a lot and really been prevented by speaking and learning their native language. For example, um, the only way that many of them can learn their language is through our Khmer Khrum Buddhist temples. But even then, those temples have been monitored by the Vietnam Buddhist Sangha. And so monks at these temples have also been harassed and interrogated and detained for trying to teach and preserve our language. So I think that there are many things that the international community and the United Nations can help to do in order to preserve our Khmer language. Uh, we especially seek the help of the UNDP to assist in distributing and informing, to help share and teach the UN DRIP and the SDGs in our Khmer language. And we also want our Khmer language to be recognized as an official second language of Vietnam because the Khmer names of our villages and districts and provinces should be widely used and our official documents should also be translated and distributed in Khmer. So I also think that if Vietnam were to implement a national action plan that acknowledges and recognizes, recognizes the Khmer Khrum people as the indigenous peoples of the Mekong Delta, then that would allow our people to take part in discussions for how to sustain our language. Um, one thing that we'd like to recognize is Canada's recently passed their Indigenous Languages Act, and we urge Vietnam to help create a, an act similar to this in order to reclaim and revitalize our indigenous language in Vietnam. Thank you so much, Priscilla. And so T, I know indigenous language is very important for you as well. And I know the UN UNESCO Specialized Agency Program is fund is also important. Could you maybe share why that might be helpful for assisting American people to maintain their language and make sure that it's alive and flourishing, not just like a jam on a jar or jelly just staying there static? Yeah, so UNESCO is a, a very important agency. Um, it's an agency that's leading actually the um, global action for the international um, decade of international uh, indigenous languages. And so, um, you know, UNESCO has a, a great, um, I guess, a great opportunity to help a lot of the indigenous uh, groups like the Khmer Khrum people by uh, helping to create a model, what I say, uh, create a more inclusive and edu ed uh, equitable education um, by developing a model for bilingual schooling in the Khmer language from kindergarten through to college and also expand to where, you know, we live. So we definitely need more Khmer school, um, but schools not just in Vietnamese and in Khmer, but also in English, because a lot of the work that we do is in advocacy in English. And we have realized that that is, you know, that is very hard for our people. Um, and so um, we would also just like to reaffirm our right to learn our language um, and that, you know, it is used correctly. And I think that UNESCO um, can really do a lot of great things um, to, uh, I think, bring the, the importance of indigenous language and also create cur curriculum that is, um, you know, that is uh, sensitive to indigenous, um, indigenous people. Um, and I know that there is a, um, we we want the, um, a greater need. Like I know Priscilla just mentioned about like how the role of our monks um, in education. It's it's through our monks, our spiritual leaders, that we have you know our culture, identity, and aspects of our language still intact. Um, because they're 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 doing Khmer um, classes in the summer, 
And so what we really want also um, with the, this theme, we want to ask the, uh, the UN and the help of the UN um, is to reaffirm the need for more independent, um, you know, indigenous institutions. So to be created in there without fear um, or influence from the state. And that's so important uh, moving forward in terms of preserving our language and identity. So T, and we know today we're so honored to be met by a monk who was actually released from prison. And he was just like many other monks. The only thing they were doing was actually teaching the indigenous language in their temples after school. And for that basic act, for exercising sustainable development goal number four, quality education, they were then forced to be detained, disappeared, and in this case, serve out a prison sentence. And it's pretty amazing, so Quintia, that you're here meeting these monks now. Why do you think that this decade of education is so important? And how can UNESCO and these UN agencies help Macron people inside the Mekong Delta? Um, okay. Thank you for your question. I really do think that we can ask uh, for like a special repertoire to come and invite them to ask Vietnam to invite a special repertoire to come to uh, talk with the people and um, try to meet an agreement with like on how to be able to like teach like the Khmer language uh, without like any like fear of, of being arrested or anything like that. Um, but I agree. I think um, in learning indigenous languages uh, is a big part of our culture. And I've been through many like um, with my experience now in the UN, uh, I've listened to many like different reports of seeing how many languages are dying out like by the thousands every year, hearing about like different stories about like different um, people like losing their culture. And it's really disheartening to see this. And we have the same issue. Um, the Khmer language is not like staying strong, but um, because of, you know, monks spreading, like being our spiritual leaders and everything, I believe that we can still stay strong, but we also have the fear of, you know, being arrested by the Vietnamese police. And we need, uh, we need to act now to prevent this from getting any worse. Honestly, it would be great to see like more people learning our language because it's such a beautiful language. Um, and like the, uh, the letters are so like decorative and really pretty. And um, I think that we should be able to spread a language, but currently in the current situation, I remember reading that um, there was a school that only taught um, Khmer language for like one hour a week. And that's like, when you learn a language, you need to learn how to practice it and have consistency because without having practice, you won't be able to actually fully understand the language. And one hour a week, taking from personal experience growing up in um, when I was younger, my parents dragged me to Khmer school when I was like seven. And I learned the thought pause, which is like the alphabet. And it took me like three years to memorize all of it, which is really sad, but um, it's slow improvement. But um, I think that with better education, these kids can learn faster and like understand their elders too, because um, the big generation gap from elders to the younger uh, generation is getting worse because of like the language barrier and improving schooling right now can help, you know, um, bridge the gap and really allow us to talk more and have a better connection with each other. Those are great points. And for the UN Decade on Indigenous Languages, I've been learning Alolo Hawaii every Thursday for just one hour a week. And I can attest, you're so right. It takes longer than an hour. It takes many hours to build that foundation. And it's not possible. One of the other exciting aspects, though, of this two-week UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues is also the focus on the six mandated areas of the Permanent Forum. So one of the exciting areas that they look at is economic and social development, culture, environment, education, health, and human rights. Maybe you can share a little bit, Priscilla, about some of these six mandated areas and what are the main concerns related to the human rights and the situation for Khmer Krom people related to those six mandated areas. These six mandated areas are all incredibly important to our Khmer Krom people especially in terms of economic and social development, as well as culture and education and human rights, as we've discussed. Um, one of them that we haven't been able to dig into as much as the human rights 
And so currently, as um, we speak, uh, there was a one of the farmers in um, the Mekong Delta was has been arrested um, last year for trying to defend his land um, for farmers um, because the the Vietnamese government took confiscated this land. And so this is only one instance. Um, there have been many other Khmer activists that have tried to defend their land, but they've been interrogated and harassed and even tortured. And so this is probably one of the most crucial areas that um, our Khmer people need justice for. Um, and in, in addition, we talked about the cultural aspects of our indigenous language and how we can improve that education by implementing it into primary schools through college. However, um, one aspect that isn't discussed enough regarding the economic and social development is their inequality in terms of the workers' rights, in terms of how our Khmer people are able to compete on an international level in terms of exporting their produce, their rice especially, um, because they are forced to sell at lower prices for the other industries and the government to profit. So I think there's so much more for our people to, for us to go in order for us to advocate for them in order to get justice for these human rights abuses, in order to improve the social and economic conditions of our people in the Mekong Delta, and then as well as uh, environmental uh, sustainability. Thank you so much. And Soti, how about you? What do you think some of the priorities are around education, health, human rights, culture, as well as economic, social and development? Yeah, so I think uh, definitely with the COVID pandemic, um, we are very behind in terms of our development in those areas. Um, I think it, there was a lot of things that were happening that were put on hold. So for example, education, a lot of our kids were unable to go to school and they didn't have access to the internet. And so we are very concerned and worried, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the progression towards uh, uh, moving forward in terms of education. Um, and then there was also a lot of uh, health related, uh, limited access to health uh, during this time. And so it's, um, it's, 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 it's really, really, there's, there's so much that needs to be done and addressed. And so um, having the opportunity to, to be here to kind of uh, provide recommendations to all the different agencies that can help us create projects, um, it's, it's vital to, um, I guess, to, to us moving forward um, and being engaged um, and being able to, to benefit right from um, from the work of the UN and making sure our people are represented. So, yeah. Thank you. And so, Contia, what do you think are some of the most important issues that could come under these six mandated areas related to education and health and human rights, as well as economic and social development? I think, um, so, I think human rights and having the ability to like, I okay, I learned this from my history teacher, which is a bit out of topic, but um, my teacher taught, taught me that, oh, um, I think that human rights is the best, uh, the most important right, having the feeling of safety, because while survival, you have to find food, water, and stuff like that, and schooling, but if you're being murdered, or like, there's like constantly like, um, enforcement trying to like, um, be on your back, you can't find like the basic necessities before you keep yourself alive. So the idea of having safety and making sure that your rights are protected is crucial to be ensure that you are in a good environment and a good place. Um, and I think that's one of the most important mandates out of this mandate. That's wonderful. And it's great to be with all four of you here at the permanent forum. And so team, it reminds me as we closing, I remember you coming from Australia for the first time and speaking on the floor of the permit forum and you got a thunderous applause when you really spoke truth to power about what was going on in the Mekong Delta. Reflecting on that, how do you feel the progress that we've made? I've heard Moni sharing that the people inside Kampuchea.com are standing up more, are watching things live on their telephones and gauging and even around the sustainable development goals. Maybe you can share a bit about that in your perspective. 
Yeah, so I think uh, having been doing this work and I appreciate working with you all those years, I remember like starting and not knowing and how, and you having you to help guide us in all learning about the, the UN and things like that. So um, I think there we have come so much. I mean, we started off not knowing anything and now like the world knows uh, everything knows a lot more about Khmer Krom. So if you did a Google search of Khmer Krom, there's like pages and pages and pages um, about it. And then it just shows the, the work that we do is, 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 is working, right? And so um, just recently, the fact that our, um, our youth is uh, able, is, is courageous enough to, uh, you know, put their lives on the line because they felt it's important to have this right um, that they're printing it out. It doesn't matter if they're going to get harassed. They know what they're doing is right, and they're trying to access that right. I think that is just absolutely amazing. It's very inspiring, and we're, we we want to to um, promote this and improve it. And so the work that we do is so so important. Um, but like I said, with with technology, with Facebook, we can directly connect with them. Um, we can share, we can translate. It, it's it's phenomenal. It's just changing the face of the work that we do, and I think it's very exciting. Um, it's very important, and uh, we definitely. I think the only other thing that I would add is that just the amount of women that has come through <laughs> since uh, since you know. Um, I think uh, KKF is amazing in the sense that. We are able to bring a lot of different people in. We have the older, we have the youth, but we also have the women. So, you know, you can see here there's Priscilla and then there's Sokontir and so much youth that have come through. And that's something I'm really proud of to be part of this organization is the diversity uh, of people that we've been able to bring to be engaged on board, not just inside uh, of Kamtia Grom, which is most important, but also um, the work we do outside, where we're bringing communities together, learning about our rights together. It, it is exciting. I remember in 2004, when we first met the KKF, it was all suits and ties. And it is exciting now, as we're looking at a election for your organization coming up, to see you, and then even as you could almost say the next generation, now that you're a proud mother, and seeing college students and high school students coming and speaking from the feminist perspective for a strong foreign policy that reflects with women's rights at its core. And I also remember the important work that you did at the UN Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And I know it's historic because Moni is preparing for the upcoming UN Committee on the Rights of the Child that will be looking at children's rights inside the Mekong Delta and looking at Articles 17, 29, and 30 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So, so much is happening and it's so great to see the Khmer Crown people on the global stage and people knowing who you are and talking about the important issues in the Mekong Delta. I know we only have a couple seconds left. Priscilla, is there anything you'd like to add in these closing moments of Cooper Union? Thank you, yes. I would just like to add how much of a privilege this has been to come to New York and be at the United Nations and stand inside the General Assembly for the first time in two years, like all the other indigenous peoples, and just meet these brothers and sisters from around the world that share so many of our struggles. And also just coming from the US, being able to speak on behalf of the Khmer Krum Jikram Federation and our Khmer Krum people in the Mekong Delta has truly just been an honor. It is exciting to exercise these human rights that we know of to then make a difference for peoples around the world. And we'd like to thank you all for participating and sharing about the 21st session of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues with the World. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. 
You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.